Madhvi, Padmashri Avardi has joined the session. So, uh, Lakshmi Prasad ji, please. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Anveshi Talks. Um, India, as we know, is a, is a very ancient civilization. And uh, the fact that we are 5,000 year old uh, is now part of common knowledge. From academic debates to social media banter, we see this line being throw, thrown um, without the fear of uh, being held accountable for its veracity that we are 5,000 years old. But where does this 5,000 year marker come from? Um, if you were um, a traditionalist in the 19th century, then probably you would not be very happy with this myopic view of Indian history because our, our, our Vedas and our uh, literature talks about much longer timelines. Uh, at the same time, if you were an Indologist in, in the 19th century, then probably you wouldn't take Indian history farther than 3,500 years ago because that was the time when they thought the Aryan invaders came to India and Rig Veda was compiled. You know, there was no meeting ground for these two viewpoints uh, for a long time. Uh, but, uh, you know, one a key discovery changed all this. The discovery of the archaeological sites of Harappa and Mohenjo-Daro about 100 years ago has changed the entire narrative. Now, here we are facing with a civilization that is as old as the pyramids, uh, but is also as modern as pre-industrialized Europe. Now, um, the Western Indologists had to take a backseat and then change their theories. Uh, invasion became migration, and today the whole theory has become a laughing stock. On the traditionalist camp, they had no reason to reject this new discovery, even though it doesn't figure out in any of the Puranas. Uh, they owned it up because it empowered them to counter the Indologist uh, accounts. <clears throat> so all this is possible. This meeting ground is possible uh, because of the disciplines of archaeology epigraphy, numismatics, and more recently, genetics. Now, it, it is at this point, uh, I would like to introduce our esteemed guest today, eminent archaeologist, Padmashri Awadi, Dr. K.K. Mohammed. Uh, Dr. Mohammed doesn't need an introduction. He's a well-known figure. Um, he's been part of uh, many uh, excavations and which led to many, many discoveries. Uh, he's most famous for his stand on the Ram Mandir issue. He was part of uh, the initial excavation done by Professor B.B. Lal in the 70s. And then uh, he also um, painstakingly reconstructed the Bhateshwar group of temples under extremely dangerous circumstances by dealing with the decoids, as well as with the mining lobby. And this story is now a legend. Uh, he's also been part of a restoration of the temples in Dantewada district of Chhattisgarh, again, in, under dangerous circumstances by dealing with the next slide by convincing them. He also uh, 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 discovered the Christian past of Patepur Sikri by, by making excavations um, at the Ibadat Khana, which led to new knowledge. So uh, without further ado, I would like to, I'd like Dr. K.K. Mohammed to take over uh, and enlighten us uh, with his knowledge today. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much, Lishmi Prasadji, for inviting me for this uh, discussion and a talk with uh, all of you because you, know, you come from various walks of life. And this is uh, very important to know about the culture and civilization of our country. Our culture and civilization goes back to a time when history was very fresh and time stood still. We have monuments that are so still and yet very eerily alive that defy sometimes a belief and imagination. It's a huge country. A huge country means one of the seventh largest countries in the world with a length of 3,200 kilometers and a width of 2,900 kilometers. A very big country and we have got almost all the races which you can think of in various parts of the world, because we have got Aryans, we have got Dravidians, whether, I don't know whether you would believe in all those theories. We have got Aryans, we have got Dravidians, we have got Mongoloids, we have got proto astroloids And then a different kinds of people, they have gone from various parts of the world also. So it is a 
when we talk about india india is really a, a museum of world uh, civilization and uh, but we did not know for a long time about the rich heritage of the country because of the uh, this one invasions at various periods of our secret history so i am not one of those who would be always blaming this european colonial historians because now there is a trend to blame the colonial historians like alexander cunningham or uh, sir william jones and many others that they have created this kind of narrations and they are responsible for this kind of wrong narrations and other things they tried in their best uh, to rediscover the history of india because uh, but you know they had their own limitations but now new theories have come new information has come on the basis of which we can of course we can modify our own opinion so i'll just go to uh, my slides and take you to those places so i mean we perhaps did not know because of various invasions and other things that mahatma buddha was in india we did not know the biggest historians of those time that was the biggest historian at that time was sir william jones in 1984 sorry in uh, 1784 he said that most probably he might be an egyptian or he is an african and we of course did not know because bakhtiyar khilji in 12th and 13th century he had completely destroyed our great nalanda university he had destroyed our udandapuri university he had destroyed our uh, vikram shila university he had destroyed our somukra university and various other universities and buddhism was completely wiped out all the great libraries ratnaganja ratnodadi ratnasagara these were three very important libraries in nalanda all of them were destroyed so we did not know about buddha that he was an indian but at the same time buddhism was not a buddhism was not a living religion in india but it was a living religion in tibet it was a living religion in nepal it was a living religion in burma and in various parts of the china and many other places so uh, uh, that way we did not know we we did not know about ashoka also that he was an indian about buddha we thought that because uh, many he is a uh, egyptian because he's the from whatever sculptures have been excavated in different parts of the world especially in burma in sri lanka and many other places he had that curly hair was there so that was one of the uh, this one auspicious symbols 84 march in nas but uh, people mistook that i mean he was an egyptian he was an a or an african then when did we come to know no he was an indian it took almost 18 it was only in 1841 42 we came to know that he was an indian that is number 1 similarly about ashoka also we did not know that he was an indian we mostly the historians of the period at that time thought that he is from sri lanka because in sri lanka there was a king known as priyadarshini devanam priyadarshini there was a king but not in india then how did we come to know similarly we thought that our history goes back only up to 5th or 6th century bc at most 6th century bc before that we had of course some kind of culture but was it what was it whether it was a vedic civilization or it was some other civilization we were hazy we did not know very clearly what it was but then it was the work of various people various colonial people i would say i am not one of those who will criticize them there could be some missionaries one or two missionaries with the people with the missionary spirit also but at the same time with the course of one or two people leveling the whole 
people who had done tremendous work for dis- discovering india that would not have come to us i mean we would not have been able to rediscover us if these people had not done very meticulous work and the whole credit goes to them and the most important person for in that one was sir william jones of course his some of his theories are faulty but he was working on the basis of the information he had gained till that time and now of course we have got more data so are there on the basis of which we can modify our own opinion but there should not be we should not label them as colonialist or missionaries that was this person he had set up a, that uh, uh, this one royal asiatic society and then people started discovering and discussing also about the great indian heritage so that was one starting point and the second starting point as far as this one was was uh, james prinsep it was james prinsep who had deciphered brahmi script brahmi script was noticed the we did not know what was the date also that was noticed at various places and the first one was that there was a pillar now we know that it is a shogun pillar but at that time we did not know that it was an ashogan pillar in the ashogan pillar of delhi delhi means in a ferocha kotla but that was not from delhi it was of course from pancha it was brought by ferocha to delhi and on which there were certain inscriptions were there but people did not know how to read it and similar this one pillars were in alahabad also similar pillars were there in bihar also there were also inscriptions on those things but nobody knew what was the inscription what it is written and then the credit goes to this man that is james prinsep for deciphering what was written on that one so that was the th- second one and then the third most important person is alexander cunningham alexander cunningham was working under this one james prinsep it was he who had discovered nalanda and before that we did not know what was the nalanda university the translation of huang sang was not there because so the translation of huang sang came in 1857 we did not know anything about nalanda university the place of nalanda at that time it was known as badgao that is a very huge uh, this one village we did not know anything about nalanda university and then he got two inscriptions from there in which it was written about nalanda so he came to know this was nalanda university so he did a very very important work and uh, who discovered that way uh, this one our great uh, harappa and mohenjadaro of course the place was noticed uh, in 1826 that the harappa the place of harappa was noticed but people thought that it might be 300 or 400 years back that harappa alexander cunningham also went to that place he also saw the thing and he tried to date it but he could not but somehow he felt you know he had got one seal he had discovered so he did not know about the relevance and importance of that seal also but when a seal of similar type was discovered 500 kilometers away from that place by marshal that is roughly after 75 years then they realized the importance of the seal and then they started comparing it and then they started publishing about it and then when we got a similar seal from kish and uh, this one uh, the mesopotamian sites and that too at a date of 2300 bc for the first time the history of india was pushed back from 600 bc to 2600 2400 or 2300 bc so that credit goes to john marshall it was he who had this one so we'll go into all these details so this before that how did archaeology come up in the world context of course in uh, this one in 78 ad there was a huge eruption of a volcano 
that was in Italy. It is known as Pompe. Then there was another city known as Herculaneum. The whole city was completely covered. So for 1800 years, it was completely covered. Then it was in 1740 when they were laying pipeline for water. They came to know about a bereaved city. And then the whole city has been now excavated. So that comes almost 1740, 1750. That was one place, and one was Bombay, and the second was Herculean. And then the second, the most important city, he was the excavation at Troy. Troy, we all know about uh, this one, the Troy, uh, Helen of Troy. We also know about Iliad. Iliad, this, of course, there was, it was a war story like our Ramayana. And uh, if there was Helen in the say, city of Troy, we have got another Sita in the city of this one, Ra uh, this Ravana, that is Sri Lanka. So it was a similar story. Henrik Kleeman, he was a German. He was able to, almost in 1870, he was able to discover the city of Helen, that is the city of Troy, on the basis of the excavations, which he had carried out on the basis of Homer. And similarly in India, also a number of people, they carried out the explorations and excavation. So this is, I mean, when the city was, the city of Bombay was completely buried. It was buried almost for 20, I mean, the feet of uh, Vulcan House. And then they excavated, they had a tremendous interest in all these things. And a huge city came out, out of that one in Bombay. These are all passing references, you know, because, you know, then there were many human bodies were there, many wooden structures were there, all, they were all the, the organic things. So huge voids were there. Then the excavators of those times, they used them as model, um, uh, this one, I mean, uh, molds, and they, pour, they poured this one, I mean, uh, uh, material into that one. And then they came to know how people were killed. So these are all, you know, uh, this one, uh, malls out of which, you know, it was, uh, there were voids there. When they put this, this one, uh, oil and other things, material into it, fibers and other things, this kind of a picture emerged out. Uh, this is a huge street was there. It was also completely buried. Then gateways were there, the bazaar was there. And this is the city of Troy. The city of Troy was also completely buried and then medical excavation for continuously for many years. That has exposed. Biblical archaeology was another site because at the same site, biblical archaeology was going on in Kish, it was going on in Ur, it was going on in uh, Uruk in, and in many other cities. Here comes our great important man, that is this one, uh, uh, Sir William Jones. He was, uh, he came with a uh, comparative philology. He said that there is some kind of connection between Greek, between uh, Latin, between Sanskrit, between Celtic languages. He said that there is some kind of connection between all these languages. Why? Because some of the most essential words in all the languages, all these languages are the same thing, including Persian. He included Persian also in that one. Because you look at father, English word father. What is the Sanskrit word for it? Pita. What is the, this one, Latin word for it? Peter. What is the Greek words? Pater. And so he found that there is some kind of similarity. And the German words, that is better, again. Mother, we have got, of course, I mean, we call it mother. Or take it brother, we call it in Sanskrit, it, it is brother. But in this one, in, in Latin, in Latin, it is broader. Or in Greek, it is brighter. So he said that there is some kind of affinity or some kind of common source for all these things, which he considered as the Iranian languages. It was not to impose their superiority. They were already, at that time, in 1800, they were superior. Of course, they had completed, I mean, almost, they had taken over 
many parts of the india not only india many parts of the world so it was not to impose their superiority but that was a very genuine this one i mean inquisitive mind so they came with this idea and then they had a number of sanskrit scholars also working along with them and this is charles mason charles mason was in the army for a long time he was working in uh, this one agra also and then he thought that he has killed a number of persons and now he should do some very kind of constructive work so he went for an exploration so we during the exploration he came to a place known as harappa so there he saw huge mounds and mounds he asked the people what is it so they said that it might have been there i mean the raja might have been there he had done something wrong and then because you know the word, i mean god has punished him so it might be 600 700 or sometimes 1200 years old and he saw the whole harappan city like this one you can just imagine he has made a sketch also at that time you know there was no photography at that time so he made a sketch of it you can see the huge mountains going like this like this like this like this and this is down below is his party he could not understand anything so that was in 1826 in 1852 Uh, Alexander Cunningham went to the site. He wanted to understand the whole thing. He tried at various places, but he could not get any clue about the place. What what was it? The, the, what kind of uh, location was it? And what was the significance of this? He could not get any clue. He went there again in eighteen fifty three. He could not get any more clues. then he went in 1872 to the same place so in 1853 1854 1855 a major change had come in india because it was for the first time english people europeans when they came here they had introduced trains in india so one was from thane to bombay that was in 1853 that was the first one and then from karachi to this one and from lahore also lahore mutan line also so when you are making railway lines you have to have a railway track also so they wanted to have the ballast for that one the contractors were for looking for ballast so somebody said you know that I and mean, here there is a huge town is old ancient town is there where you have got enough bricks so all this bricks of this one that is the great harappa that was taken over by the contractor and he made a this one this one railway track of 100 kilometers and the whole city was that way it was lost and this man that is alexander cunningham he was highly disillusioned highly disillusioned what to do because the whole thing has gone but then he went into the site in the, the tracks so he could get one seal today we know that it is a unicorn seal at that seal he could get only one seal and then he kept it with him and he tried to look at it try to understand by this time he had already known brahm because i mean along with uh, uh, james prince of he had also worked so he knew the brahm which was a closed language for all of for indian but he had picked up it and he had i mean he was using it at various places but when he looked at this one it is not brahm so he said it might be some kind of foreign language so at that time if this was only that he could understand you know this could be some kind of foreign language this might have been the city might have been erected by some of the foreigners that is what he could that was his understanding we should not blame them for all these things and then and this is of course alexander cunningham and this is the train the first train that was uh, introduced and this train leveled up everything and then when they excavated they could as i said you know one was during the uh, surface explosion and when they excavated they could get this one that is a small seal so time went on then in 1911 and another city was reported that was mohenjo daro a very 
great archaeologist went to that site. His name was D.R. Bandarkar. He went to the site. It was roughly 500 kilometers away from uh, 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 Harappa. He went to the site. He tried to excavate. Somehow, uh, he also could not understand the significance of the place. So he just wrote in his uh, diary, it is only 200 years old, nothing more than that. Because there were bricks and those bricks were almost like English bricks. So he said, I mean, this might be 200 years old. He could not understand the significance. But then in 1921-22, R.D. Banerjee went to the site under John Marshall, he went to the site. When he excavated, I mean, uh, this one. Uh, so before that, Harappa was once more excavated by Dayaram Sani. So he got two more, this one, seals like this one. So he was getting two more seats and they did not understand the significance of it. So they were just trying to stop the excavation. And now we should not go further. We are not going to get anything. So at that time, they got a very significant information that they said that from 500 kilometers away, the site, which was of course brushed aside by the earlier man, that is, I mean, this Bandarkar, that was re-excavated by R.D. Banerjee and he has got the same kind of seals. I mean, that is 500 kilometers away from that place. So that was a very vital information. So for the first time, it alerted them, archaeologists of both the places. They said, is there anything between the same two things? Is there anything, any connecting line between the two things? Because you know, it is a different period. So in those periods, having two uh, seals of the same kind at two very different places, 500 kilometers away, that was very significant. Then they got more information. See, the bricks which they have been using, that is 30 centimeter into 15 centimeter into seven, and, uh, seven centimeter. So in Harappa also, it is the same, this one denomination, and the measurement is the same thing here also. So they were more sure, you know, there is some kind of connectivity. And then the roads, in ancient times having roads, so there is a road and similar roads this way, and then the, there are similar roads, the same kind of roads here also. Then the weights, for the weights and measures, they have got the same thing. So all these things, you know, now they started that we'll have to excavate it further. We are going to get one, I mean, some important things. But they, didn't know, they did not know what was the importance of it. When they excavated Mohanjadaro, so from the surface level, they got a seal, which goes back to, which, did, which went back to, to second century AD. So they know the surface level is second century AD and what is below what we are going to get that nobody knew at that time. So at that time, John Marshall, there was a, 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 a journal which was read in those period by almost all the people who were working in various uh, archaeological fields. Biblical archaeology, it was being, I mean, the, the many people were working on biblical archaeology and some people were working on other uh, uh, things also, uh, apart from biblical archaeology, some people were working at other places also. So they were all interconnected by a journal known as Illustrated London. So in this Illustrated London, in 1924, John Marshall, he published the seals which he, he, he had recovered from various places. And then he wrote that uh, does, uh, this one, luck does not we do not come across less often, but sometimes you know it plays a very important role. And many people are not as lucky as Sleeman. Sleeman was the man who had excavated Troy. So, but now he says, now I think I am on the uh, verge of a, some very important discovery. That is what he writes, which became very prophetic at that time. So, in 1934, he published this article. And also the photograph of this seals which he had recovered from there. 
remember that we knew that our history goes back only up to 6th century bc and beyond that there was of course a history but, but what kind of history we did not know the things were very hazy and it is from that point he is going to push back now so immediately so he when he published it immediately they got a this one a reply from h says h says was an assyriologist he was from oxford university he was an assyriologist he immediately wrote back that it looks almost like the seals which we have recovered from kish kish is a mesopotamian set it looks almost like that uh, seals which we have recovered from kish and from susa also two important sites of the biblical archaeology so that was a very important uh, with this one I mean, uh, discovery also and that was a very important piece of information also for this man and then in the next uh, this one journal ernest macke he was another man who was working in the field he said that they have got exactly the same kind of seal a dicto a replica of the same thing from a level of 2300 bc in kish and at this place so that time and change the whole perspective of looking at indian history for the first time we came to know that our history goes back to 2300 bc it could be modified further not only that more important was that we had trade relations our this one ship used to fly from here and their ships used to come from them so we had trade relations also with all these countries so we came to the very two very important information pieces that again changed the whole perspective of looking at it this was the that kind of seal that was the first seal which cunningham got there was another man known as clark he got it he looked at it it was not like an indian bull because it doesn't have a hump and then there were small six letters were there he looked at it this way that way he could not get him and he could not gather any information so he just kept it and then it was i mean after 75 years you know when they got this other seed from the other place that is from mohan jadaro then it created the curiosity it is this uh, our uh, this one bandarkar sahab who lost an opportunity because it happens it is not his mistake because it often it, it happened now there is a library also uh, uh, this one bandarkar library is also but sometimes it happens in archaeology it has happened with us all of us and then when they excavated this place this is the great john marshall and when they excavated it and this was this rd vanarthi it was he who was looking after the thing there immediately he rep um, uh, reported that we have got a very important piece of information and these were bulls like this one now we know that these are harappan bulls but at that time they did not know and many other seals also so you have a nare of seals so we know about uh, mohanjadaro we have i'm not taking much time for all this thing this these are all the information i mean we all know and just look at the kind of ornaments which they were wearing what a beautiful i mean ornaments and how did they make it their technology it is what have the technology we should uh, congratulate them and just look at it how they could shape all these things this way in those with preliminary with very very primitive tools how could they manage all these things most probably he might have been the king or some kind of religious leader and they had the drains also they had i mean they had bathrooms and the tasset bathrooms were there and then drains were there it was a very sophisticated community by the standard of 2300 or 2500 bc and of course the great you know uh, this one i mean a proto shiva because he has got that uh, trident is there he is in a yogic posture also 
it could be one could argue this way or that way that is immaterial for us and the great dancing lady just look at it when marshall got it he refused to believe that it is 2500 bc because in europe also you were not having this kind of beautiful women at that time i mean dancing women it is from that mohanjadaro film just and they had cards also of this kind this is of course a toy cart but of course if the toy cart is there i mean then that might have been the big bigger cards might have been there and this is professor of course we all know professor uh, this one sr rao sir the great historian who had discovered and excavated lothal and it was not only that one he had also discovered our great uh, another uh, that was through maritime archaeology so he was krishna's dwaraga also he is of course from bangalore and a great man i had the privilege of uh, uh, learning and reading and uh, the great lothal city because you know we speak about the ships coming and going and uh, in, uh, this one international trade also and this is the earliest uh, this one i mean uh, dockyard is an imaginary reconstruction of it of course in a museum we can keep all these things and this is uh, professor uh, another great historian you know dr r s b i mean he was our joint director general of archaeological survey of india it was he who had excavated the great dolavira city and uh, the biggest inscription has been has also been recovered from the from dolavira and uh, this has got the biggest storage uh, uh, lake of it's a huge st- storage for uh, uh, bringing water facilities and this was the inscription he had discovered from there and this is from rakigadi rakigadi i mean now genetic information that is again changing our uh, what we had earlier understood so genetically genetics is now coming into the field and that is going to change our again our perspectives and this is again of course a museum actually in archaeological survey of india and in ministry of culture they should have made museums like this one and uh, interpreted the whole thing to the world which of course neither archaeological survey of india nor other cult ministry of culture is doing everyone would say that the great i mean gaurav shali itihas ke bare mein all the parties would say and especially bjp would be uh, speak about the gaurav shali itihas but their contribution to the gaurav shali itihas is very minimal ah uh, this was a huge civilization because you know there was no other civilization which was as big as this one in those in third century bc and now we will come to that uh, this one that is the uh, the buddhist heritage because about the buddhist heritage also we did not know that buddha was a hindu and about this pillar also this is of course in delhi firosha kotla firosha he was highly impressed by seeing this pillar so what he did is he transported them from punjab originally it is in punjab from punjab he brought it there but there was a huge inscription was there uh, firosha he tried his level best to get very good scholars to read about it but nobody could read it at that time so when they went to then when they explored it Uh, that is again the credit goes to these people that is colonial historians when they went to allahabad there they could see a pillar then when they went to this one that is bihar there there were two three pillars were there loria nandangad were there loria arraj was there then there was another pillar there in uh, vaishali it was there and when they went to so many other places also they got the same kind of pillar also and the same kind of inscription also now the question comes i mean who was this king who was i mean he was he was not only in various parts of india he was there i mean, I mean his inscriptions were there in pakistan also his inscriptions were there 
in Mansara, that is Mansara is in Afghanistan also, Kandar also. And who was such a great emperor who was ruling? We did not know about Ashoka. Ashoka, there were certain mentions in some of the Puranas, but nobody knew that it was erected by Ashoka. So this is from uh, this one, I mean, uh, Allahabad. And this is Loria Nandangad, that is in Bihar. This is Loria Ariraj. So similarly, so then this man said, Princip said, that all these are in the same kind of language. And how to read it? Because, you know, in all other places, for example, there were similar problems in Egypt also. There were similar problems in this one. Uh, in Persia also, but they were lucky, they got a trilingual inscription. Trilingual inscription means one language would be Greek, another would be demotic, and the third one is, would be hieroglyphic. So if you have, because hieroglyphic was not known, that was the language of uh, this one, uh, that was the language of uh, uh, Egypt, but they did not know what was written in hieroglyphic. And what was written in demotic, that also they did not know. But it was written in Greek. The Greek was a language which was known. So on the basis of the Greek, they could discover this too. That did not happen in India. Then in Persia, the Histum inscription is there. So that is also in Elamite inscription. That is in the old Persian inscription. And then in cuneiform also on the basis of which they could decipher. But that did not happen in India. And then how did we, how did we, how could we discover our own, this one, uh, uh, Brahmi script? And they further said that up to Orissa also, the same kind of language is being used. So who is that man? So the, uh, then uh, this is on the other side, that is, I mean, in Rajasthan side. So there also it is the same language. Then they discovered some more many various other things also at various parts of the country. This is uh, this one Behistam inscription of Persia. It was in three languages, so it on the basis of which it was easy to identify. This is that uh, uh, this one the inscription in the lower part you have that uh, Greek language is there. In the middle part it is uh, demotic is there, and then you have on the top hieroglyphic. So it was easy. But very fortunately, all these people, they were working on Indo-Greek coins. Indo-Greek coins when means after the departure of Alexander, a, a, a number of dynasties ruled from here. So they were Greeks. So they had minted certain coins. And in coins, they had given both the Brahmi script also and fortunately, in Greek script also. So Greek script is known. So you can see on the left side, it is written Agado close. That is in, on the lower part, it is written down Agado close. And on the upper part, it is Raje Agado close, but not Raje, but the Rigia uh, Agado close. And here on the right one, that is on the left one. On the left one, it is written Agado close here. So you can see this is, I mean, in uh, this one, uh, Greek, and this is, this one is in Brahma. So this give them the initial clue. I mean, they got near about 10 to 12 words from this one. And then there was one more, this one, uh, coin like this one, that was Pandaloon. So from Pandaloon also, they got six, seven words, they got it. So that was in a way sufficient, but it was not fully sufficient. Here again, you can see that is Agado close. This is in, uh, on the lower portion, this is in Greek. And on the higher portion, this is in Brahmi. And then James Prince of he got 21 inscription from Sanchi. So from in that 21 inscription, all the inscriptions that had different letters, but the last three things, that was the same thing in all the in, in all the twenty-one inscriptions. 
So he just presumed that this might be on the left side. The variant was in you know, the name of the people, but the last word is gifted. That is dhanam. He just presumed it. Dhanam. This was gifted by such and such man. This was gifted by such and such man. This was gifted by such and such man. So he just presumed that that might be dhanam. and that proved to be correct on the basis of which he could identify almost he could read almost all the inscription which were there which was done by ashoka and then we did not know as i said that ashoka was an indian we did not know then calcutta bharat inscription this they read it so isme i mean in this inscription it is that priyadashi raja मगधे संगम अभिवादेदेशरण that might be the name of the king raja magade the king of magadha and sangam abhivadanam he is saluting the sangha and then the next sentence was bhagavade buddhena so that mean this is connected with buddha also but we do not know that buddha was an indian bhagava bhagavade buddhena so this was an important turning point in 1841 42 so now we know that uh, this is about buddhism so this is was the way they used to inscribe it then we have got from near bangalore there is a maski inscription is there that maski inscription was very important in the maski inscription for the first time we came to know about raja ashoka still that time it was only piyadashi devanam piya piyadashi so people were saying that this piya piyadashi He is the Sri Lankan king. He is not an Indian king. But for the first time, we from this one also, and there was another inscription that is from this one uh, uh, in, near Jansi, uh, Gujarra inscription. From these two inscriptions, we came to know that this Raja Piyadashi, Ash Raja Piyadashi Ashoka. It was I mean this mask inscription was discovered in 1915 by a gold miner. so uh, this is buddha of course and uh, this is as i said you know this is i mean there were many inscriptions like this one but these inscriptions were in two this one i mean uh, uh, sometimes karotri inscription was also there sometimes aramaic inscriptions were also there this is from sarnath when sarnath was excavated in 1835 it was excavated by a great man that is alexander cunningham but he did not know it was associated with buddha but now we know the buddhism the whole buddhism started from there but he did not know in 1835 he did not know that it was i mean uh, associated with with buddha the stupa also because you know there was no connection with buddha and india at that time but in 1842 when it was again excavated not by him but alexander uh, kitu then they got certain verses i mean which was written in buddhist this one monument and also some buddhist sculptures also from inside this stupa and then they came to know some more inscriptions also and which speaks about buddha and buddhism also and the king pala king had come to this place to pay worship to lord buddha and then he again exhorts people to accept buddhism that inscription was also recovered from here on the basis of which it was now proved no this is something associated with lord buddha and buddha could be an indian in 1902 when they were excavating the whole ashogan pillar was i mean excavated like this and this was how at that time it was looking that sarna buddha stupa was looking this is chaukandi stupa another important stupa it was looking at that time here but uh, during my period my posting there i had excavated it also and then 
Uh, Bodhgaya was uh, under a Shivaite group. It was not with Buddhism because Buddhists had ran away from here. So uh, this was, I mean, of course, I mean, from there also, they got a number of inscriptions saying that it is associated with Lord Buddha. That is about, we are, we are talking about this one, Bodhgaya Stupa. It was under the mutt of the Shivaite mutt. They saw it like this one. And from there, a number of inscriptions, not only I mean, this one in Devanagari, but also they got a number of inscriptions in Burmese language also, because Burmese people, they have been keeping the memory of this one, and they had carried out a number of excavations also, and also a number of conservations also. So Gopala inscription was there, this inscription, which speaks about Buddhism and Buddhist, uh, this one, worship was also discovered from there. And by that time in 1838, Fahian was translated into uh, this one into uh, uh, French, but not in English. In English, some pages came to I mean, this one with to some of the important people. And Fahian's at that till that time we did not know that, that Fahian was a written about Fahian had written about India. But when some of the pages came in English to India, then researchers started doing research. And they had a feeling that what the places which he has, uh, is speaking, it is about India. And then th there was a different it's a difference, it's a names of the places we, we were given. So one place was Kanoj. Kanoj was the capital at that time. And then he had said that if you go from Kanoj, seven yojanas, you would be reaching at a very important place which is associated with Buddha. And there is a Buddhist stupa, sorry, Buddhist stupa also, and an Ashogan pillar also there. So the, for the first time, Alexander Cunningham, he walked towards the north-south direction because he had given the north direction also. So when he reached there, he said that you have to go to Sankisa. Sankisa, you have an, uh, this one, Ashogan pillar also, and a stupa also. That is this much of kilometers away from here. So that was given in Fahia, on the basis of which he walked. And when he reached at a place known as Sangasa, he got a Ashogan pillar. And there was an elephant also on that pillar, because he speaks about that elephant also. And there was a stupa also. By now, people came to know, I mean, all these places, I mean, where about, Fagyan was speaking about India only, and then they started discovering various places like not only Sankisa, Shavasti, and various other places also. But Fagyan had not gone to Nalanda. So there was no mention about Nalanda, but there was a mention about Nalo, where there was a, this one, a small city was there, and they educational center also, and a, and a stupa also. So we did not know about Nalanda at that time. Some people went to Badga because in 1811, this place was Francis, uh, this one, uh, Hamilton. He went to Nalanda. He saw the whole Nalanda city, but it, this name was Badga, not Nalanda. He saw the whole city. He was highly impressed. And he asked somebody, so he, they said, this was the palace of a great king. And he believed in that one. I took now 50 years again for a discovery. No, this was not palace of a king. This was the great Nalanda University. That took almost 50 years. It was when I showed, when uh, the same Alexander Cunningham, he went to the place. By that time, in 1853, Huangsang was also translated into French, but in 1857, it was translated into Eng English also. But in 1857, the great uh, riot was there. That was the first uh, mutiny was there. First uh, uh, Indian freedom struggle was there. So he could not do much work. But in 1861, when he went to the site, he went to a village known as Kapadia village. There he got two inscriptions on which the name Nalanda was written. So it was on the basis of that he could discover the whole Nalanda University. So when he traveled from Kannos, to Sankisa, he got this, I mean, uh, Fahian had spoken about it, he could get this one. And then there was a small stupa also. 
and then deepa vamsha deepa mahavamsha and deepa vamsha are these two very important things so in deepa vamsha it was spoken because it had clearly written that ashoka came after 218 years of the death of lord buddha and he was the son of bindusara and grandson of chandragupta maurya he ruled ujjain from ruled from ujjain so he was ruling from ujjain means at that time he was a prince so this was given in deepa vamsha and then this information was compared with maski in, in, in this one and bairat inscriptions and also with gujarra uh, inscription so now we became it was very clear no this is about the great I man ashoka was an indian and buddha was also an indian devanam piya sa ashoka stanislas union it was i mean it was translated into french first and in the nalanda university students were i mean every day there were, there used to be 100 classes used to be there it was a huge university with 10000 students and uh, 1500 teachers and uh, the day why is not sufficient for asking and answering profound questions those who came to the portals of this center of learning they were they went impressed by this one these are all they went back impressed by its magnificent architecture so such a huge university and uh, there it had three very important libraries dharmaganja dharmodadi uh, ratnaganja ratnodadi ratnasagara and uh, information because you know, the, it was a great center of learning not only learning but it was a great center of the, this one uh, this one information uh, dissemination or uh, technological transfer also because in you know, all whatever was their information that was immediately translated into chinese into mongolian into tibet into nepalese into turkish languages and uh, japanese languages korean languages and people took away from all this information from india uh, when uh, huang chang went back he took near 751 books from india when yi jing also call it we it's saying when he went away he took 400 books from india Similarly, there were more than 200 uh, Chinese students at various periods of time. One of them took away books. I mean, the books were copied from here. This was a manuscript center, copying center. And the king of Balabutra Deva, he was a Sumatra king. He was the king of Sumatra from Shailendra dynasty. He had donated five villages only for this one, this for the translation bureau of uh, Nalanda University. which was taken to other uh, university that is uh, chinese university chinese uh, uh, centers and from there they translated into various other especially chinese languages so this was a technology transfer center also and it was a information transfer center also most of the books in sanskrit was syllabus and this might have looked like this one because on one side you can see uh, this one the temples are there on the one side and on the other side the monasteries are there so when the early uh, this one people came they saw the huge university the conical mount they saw but they did not know explorers when they came they saw the conical mount but they did not know what was inside that one but now we know we, I mean, below the conical mount there were temples were there and then they speak that is hamilton mukarna hamilton speaks he speak there were square this one uh, mounds also what was below the square mount below the square mounds were the great monasteries huge monasteries were there only 70% of the whole university has been excavated the rest is even now lying there bhakti arkil ji ke and uh, he completely he came along with 200 people but he completely destroyed the entire university and the huge library that was the greatest loss for the country the whole university and the whole library was completely burned to the ground and when all of them were killed he called some people to read but you know all the people had died 
so when they started getting the seal shri nalandaya mahavihara aadya bhikshu sangarsya then we came to know that it was the great nalandaya and the earlier people they saw when I, this one francis hamilton came he saw like this one huge mounds that is a conical mound conical mound means that means the it is i mean in this one i mean uh, temples you are going to get from below this is on this side you can see this uh, other type of mounds also uh, this is square mounds you can see this square mounds are i mean you are going to get the monasteries again they had seen it like this one from out of this one archaeological survey of india then almost for i mean for the last 160 years they excavated it and in the earlier period it was the prisoners who were used for the excavating it the square monasteries came up so it was a platform for the teacher to sit and the students would be sitting in front of it and there was a well also for drawing water and uh, this was because in a sense it was deserted it was occupied by a number of uh, people that is i mean uh, shepherds shepherds they did not know that they were occupying on the top of a, one of the greatest universities in the world so they made one house first and when the numbers increased they made one more house on this side and now for the early archaeologists they had to dismantle the house for excavating it so when they discover uh, dismantled they got this corner tower this corner tower was where i have written one they got this corner tower this house is that is number 2 is yet to be discovered yet to be dismantled and then it was also dismantled so i mean they went further down so one corner tower the one full corner tower came if there is one corner i mean you are discovering the corner if you are getting one corner tower that means as per panchayatna you are going to get four more corner towers so you can see two corner towers and similarly all these things done so you can just see because earlier there was only one house and then the second house also came up but here i mean we have dis- i mean dismantled the second house and uh, we when we went further down the whole corner tower came then one more corner tower one more this one this is third uh, temple number 3 so similarly a number of uh, earlier it was it might have looked like this one and then a number of sculptures also uh, during my posting there i carried out a number of conservation works now it almost of all the the are very neat and tidy now and the great library might have been here now yang sang says that it was four story i mean all the monasteries were four story but how to say it was four story so here we got this one also that is this uh, uh, staircases to go up so the excavation is going on because earlier you had seen it like this one and now just look at it just look at it what a majestic university has come up from this one again just look at it one cannot imagine such a great university was there so all this have come up from the earlier portions which was completely buried 160 uh, years have taken but you know even now only 70 percent of the university has been excavated 30 percent of the university is still buried we have been trying our level best to impress upon the government if the government wanted you know they is very easy for them but you know there is no will to do all these things they might you might be making many hundred international universities in the name of nalanda but what about the original nalanda university whatever is buried there because many people have built houses there that area should have been acquired that should have been excavated present it in a very beautiful way to the whole world i mean make system of uh, this one uh, guiding compulsory so that people otherwise you know what what happens is the people just come they just see some of this one they don't understand the history they don't know how to 
view a monument, how to go to a monument, what was the history. And here was Yang Shang who had come, who had traveled 16,000 kilometers only to study in uh, Nalanda. Only to study in Nalanda. And when he went out, he took 756 books. Almost 200 students, you know, who had come from uh, this one, China, they have been doing it like that one. They came on food, they came on elephants, sometimes they were, came on with the whole of food. But it was a because, you know, if you tell this history, that would change your own Kundalini also. Because, you know, you have to put a tongue in each and every stone. The stones will speak to you. And a similar, I mean, the government should, what the government should do, I had made a proposal also that, I mean, before entering Naranda, you had to have a small film about Naranda. Recently, I have also made a small documentary that should be shown to the people so that they should know what was the history, the heritage of our this one. And then take them with a guide, not without a guide. You should always have a guide. Take them to all these places, like our great Hampi. They would be able to put a tongue in each and every stone. And by the time you come back, you know, you would be a completely surcharged man. You would be a completely different man. Because, you know, that kind of experience we should be able to provide in all our monuments. That will raise our Kundalini. You will be a completely different man by the time you come back. But the government is not thinking about all this. Whichever government, whether it is a Congress government or it's a BJP government and the BJP government, I say that it's, they have completely destroyed the archaeological survey of India. So these are all, and there was timekeeping was also there. I mean, it was for timekeeping. So I think now I have taken enough of your time. It is almost more than uh, one hour. And uh, uh, I'll uh, stop it here because, you know, there are so many things to say, but, you know, it will take time. And uh, these are all the conservations and preservation that was going on during my posting there. I've been trying to... Uh, now, because earlier it was, uh, the understanding was it was in the antiquity of Nalanda goes back only up to 5th century AD. But now the recent researchers have gone that uh, it has go it goes back to three, uh, 3rd century BCE. And for removing mud, you know, there was a train also because, you know, there was, a, I mean, many trains were there. I mean, many, there. so they used to have a patri that is a rail on which it used to run. So these are various people because I used to associate the people because you, know, you have to, you should not be an island. An archaeological officer should not be an island. You have to get the people, you have to get the monks, you have to get the schools because I used to tell the people that you should come and help Archaeological Survey of India. Archaeological Survey of India is running on a very shoestring budget. It doesn't have any funds like tourism department. But people can come and help. When you come and help a monument which was built during the period of Ashoka, which means you are becoming a, a this one, a shareholder with Ashoka or with Chandragupta Maurya or with such great thing, people. So I used to instill this kind of feeling and then take a vow, take an oath in front of the monument that you will not be scribbling on the monument because if you go to Hampi, Ayahole, Patadakal, Badami, and all these places, you will be finding a number of people writing their name. So you have to stop the student. So the students used to come. They used to do Karseva, and the monks also used to come and instill a new confidence, a new education method in them, and also tell them that this is your proud heritage. It is for you to conserve and preserve it. This way, we would be able to change the mindset of the people also. So thank you all. Thank you very much for giving a very patient hearing. And uh, if you have any other questions, you know, I'm most willing to answer all these two questions. Thank you very much, Prasad. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you. That's a fascinating talk uh, and, and a lot to process in such a short time. Um, I mean, uh, the, the, uh, there are lots of questions, obviously. Uh, with your permission, sure. probably we can take a few of them. I, but yeah. what comes to my mind is... Um, Buddha, who is uh, today seen as 100% Indian, everyone accepts that, was forgotten some 200 years ago. And uh, when Colin McKenzie visited my hometown of Amaravati, he saw that the stupa was being dismantled to build the king's palace. 
and that's when that's when he discovered the mound and the famous amaravati stupa came to the surface uh, it's fascinating how archaeology can uh, reverse the deterioration of some of these sites and actually uh, reconstruct them and bring history back to life so with that uh, we have few questions here i'll ask uh, ragottam ji to um, uh, to to present them to you sir uh, yeah uh, the first question that uh, we have received from the participants is from dr kejo uh, gopalakrishna from bangalore uh, his question is you said buddha was thought to be an egyptian but we had him in various puranas and uh, temple sculptures so why was this ignored of course i mean buddha is mentioned in various puranas and he is on all the avataras also malsya purma varahasya narasinghi vamana tide ramo ramasya ramasya buddha kalki tide tade so that is our understanding so of course buddha was of course part and parcel of our indian heritage or hindu heritage also you can say it should not be ignored but no i mean this one i mean these are now we are trying to understand sometimes you know from the point of view of hinduism sometimes from the point of view of buddhism and sometimes from the point of view of jainism and sikhism also these are all indian religion it is i mean branches of the same kind of thought but sometimes you know they will be having a different kind of uh, understanding because buddha was one who Uh, stood against the pernicious caste system earlier in our rigveda also and uh, it was not a very this one when I mean, caste system started from the rigveda uh, brahmasyo mukham asit bahu rajanya krite urtad asye yad vaisye padayo shudra chayade but that was not a very uh, this one very 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 stringent at that time but uh, later on it became shudra machara samyukta durada parivardhi the retreat shudra should be kept away then it became a very impo- a big problem so it was for the first time buddha was one person and along with mahavir jain also who rebelled against this caste system so that was a very significant achievement and this is of the university also because you know this unleashed the pent up energy of the marginalized people so i called them the marginalized people the downtrodden people that was the message so it is of course the same thing because we believe in sarve bhavantu suginam sarve sandu diramya that is the main indian thought but sometimes you know some kind of aberration comes up and which is of course being rectified that is yada yada hi dharmasya gnani bhavadi bharate and another question from uh... mahen patle uh, is is there any remote sensing technology which can trace out the structure below the ground of course in even in ayodhya also it was the remote sensing technology which was instrumental in identifying various structures before excavation gpr survey ground penetrating survey is there because it was that was done at ayodhya by a canadian company so they said that below the mosque there are many structures are there earlier the colonial historians had said you know the mosque the mosque has been built on a very virgin land below that there was nothing no temple no mosque nothing like that one and then when this canadian i mean this one gpr survey said no there are structures but below than one then they did not want to do the excavation because you know they could not so many things and the excavation was carried out that is a different history itself no thing can be associated with the temple scheme of another question from uh, uh, mahen patle only uh, he is asking it is said that nalanda university was established during buddhist period may it be possible that it was more ancient than buddhist period no it is uh, uh, that was an important place of places he used to uh, sit there there might have been a small patshala there at that time but we don't have any historical records of being a uh, uh, university before 3rd century bc before 3rd century bc mean that is the period of ashoka 
there might have been a part shala might have been there but not a huge structure that is possible because uh, the uh, surrounding places was also excavated so there also we have got certain historical things which goes back to 13th century bce but at this particular place, surrounding we have not about this city we cannot we cannot say that it was i mean we before 3rd century bc we just cannot push it back i mean as a great institution that might have been patshalas and other might thing might have been there that is possible dr gopal krishna uh, his question another question is that did i miss you mentioning sir mortimer wheeler a uh, mortimer wheeler of course i mean a great of course archaeologist but he did not work there at uh, this site uh, nalanda site or uh, wherever we are just we are discussing of course he worked in uh, harappa mohenjadaro and all those places but not at this site yes of course i admit my mistake you know i should have mentioned because you know his contributions are very great but it somehow it did not come in my this one but his uh, contribution is immense and great great man who did a lot of work for the indian archaeology and there are many other people also i mean i have missed out so many names but you know there are number of people especially in our the karnataka and other parts also colonel mckenzie is there he has done in manso amaravathi rashmi prasad ji was talking about amaravathi and to various other places you know great people they have done a lot of people but uh on what other archaeological sites except ayodhya the gpr technique was used and now it is because now that is a new technology so in almost all the recent excavations we are using this the same kind of technique because earlier it was not there so it was not easily available also but now it is easily available there are number of scientific institutions that are helping us archaeological survey of india in uh, new excavations we are i mean uh, mostly we are using it now uh, yes but on what sites actually uh, i can't exactly say which site because you know i am also now retired from the archaeological survey of india from uh, the last 10 to 12 years i am also retired so we don't do any excavations also that way but in almost all the sites now they are using it yeah uh, mitchi would you would you like to try once again yes sir sir namaskar mohan ji i have a question yeah uh, first uh, thank you sir for such a fantastic uh, lecture the my the first question comes to my mind ki the destruction of nalanda how it affected our our history usse hame kya nuksan hua actually hum kitna piche chale gaye itihas mein aur baki kshetron mein मेरे ख्याल में इट वॉज ए इतना बड़ा मार पड़ा है फॉर द होल इंडियन सिविलाइजेशन बिकॉज इन ऑफ द होल नॉलेज सिस्टम वॉज कम्प्लीटली लॉस्ट नॉट ओनली इट वॉज लॉस्ट टू इंडिया इट वॉज ऑफकोर्स ए गेन फॉर अदर कंट्रीज लाइक चाइना जापान दिस वन कोरिया एंड ऑल अदर दिस वन सो वी हैव बीन पुश बैक इट वॉज ए ग्रेट पुश बैक फॉर अस Uh, how to uh, quantify it in terms of this one i can't say but this was the biggest setback which indian civilization received uh, in the hands of this one bhakti arkil ji and other people great loss for the country actually jo books ye le gaye chinese and japanese can uh, can't we copy them and uh, brought it back to india now ah uh, we have been uh, this one it has been uh, the government should take interest in all these things and things are now i think that on a, a this one uh, cultural relations uh, department is taking up all those things also and uh, it is going on in certain places but at certain places it is not happening the government should have people like uh, shri jagmohan ji and especially for the ministry of culture and tourism there should be some passionate people like jagmohan ji during uh, this one इनके वाजपेयी जी के पीरियड में उस तरह की जब तक मिनिस्टर आपको नहीं होंगे तब तक ना कोई इम्प्रूवमेंट नहीं होगा कोई इम्प्रूवमेंट होगा बाकी जो है गौरवशाली इतिहास के बारे में बात करेंगे लेकिन ग्राउंड रियलिटी क्या है हम लोग भी जानते हैं राइट 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 सर सर मेरा दूसरा क्वेश्चन है इंडस वैली स्क्रिप्ट के बारे में कि वो अभी तक क्यों डिसाइफर नहीं हो पाई है 
हमको जब तक जो ना बाइलिंगल या ट्राइलिंगल ये नहीं मिलेंगे तब तक जो ना आई मीन इट इज वेरी डिफिकल्ट टू डिसाइड फॉर इट एंड वो भी बहुत ज्यादा नहीं है इसमें तो ओनली ट्वेंटी वर्ड्स आर देयर सो इट इज ऑलमोस्ट लाइक हीरोग्लिफिक जैसे है तो इसको जो ना जब वो नहीं मिलेंगे ट्राइलिंग लैंग्वेज नहीं मिलेंगे बड़ा मुश्किल है वो नहीं पाएगा पीपल आर ट्राइंग विद द हेल्प ऑफ कंप्यूटर्स एंड अदर थिंग्स लेकिन it is not being resolved sir uh, but i like to share ki i have written a history book acha swift horses ah. sharp swords it's about medieval to ek chapter isme mera nalanda pe bhi hai isme ki how he destructed the nalanda university and how he then invaded bengal acha so yeah. I, i would like to present this book to you so how can i go uh, kaise kar sakta hu main main mail address de dunga aapko क्योंकि नाउ यू हैव माय ईमेल आल्सो मेल एड्रेस तो पोस्टल ओके 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 जी जी प्लीज प्लीज आल्सो आल्सो पोस्ट पोस्ट लिंक लिंक ऑन द द इन चैट सो सो दैट आवर कैन श्योर 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 थैंक 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 यू 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 राइट अवे सो मच सो मच ऑफ टाइम विल टेक uh he says uh, sir are we extending the survey or research process at serious level at mathura and kashi vishwanath uh, like we did at ayodhya to establish the facts by asi mathura and ayodhya because you know that is uh, you know mathura and vishwanath that is very plain it's not nothing is hidden there it is i mean you just go and see the this one temple you know it is very clear and there are many historical references also about it that it has been completely destroyed so there you don't need any kind of historical uh, new information or excavations there in these pictures these are very clear but the thing is you know if there is a 1991 religious act is there so according to that religious act is the cut off here for this one would be whether it is a temple or it is a mosque or it is a church that is 1947 that is 15th of august except ayodhya because the case was going on on ayodhya so on the basis of which you know an exception was given to ayodhya but we cannot make any more claims but ideally it should have been of course these three places should have been because i had given many statements also in this regard i mean it should have been given these three important places should have been given to hindus uh, for the construction of the temple that should have been there but that did not happen now it is a constitutional question they should resolve it so just one more question uh, and we'll end with that uh, vijay tejra reddy asks uh, there is a notion that asi isn't doing well enough uh, and regular uh, and has regular trouble with funds in what way ordinary people could contribute to archaeological and heritage sites yes he is very right uh, especially since the last year seven years you know it is in a very bad shape we all thought you know because you know once the bjp comes you know it would be in a, uh, it would be improving its position but it's not like that it is uh, i had made it this thing in many of this rss meetings also but you know they don't want to improve the situation now it is in a very and especially about structural conservation there are two things one is i mean uh, making toilets and other things so they would be making huge toilets that is going on that they have got a different agenda but when it comes to structural conservation for example hampi i hold a patadakal badami we have got all this great temples are there you know there the structural conservation should have taken place so their things are now in a very bad shape it's in the last seven years when i say seven last years means it is the bjp period but it was during vajpayee sahab period it was not like that so that is what happening now i mean ordinary people can stay now because you know uh, for example i had uh, in uh, there is a place known as in chambal valley that is known as batakshar where i had uh, uh, conserved near about 80 temples 80 temples mean it was in a huge earthquake the entire temple town had fallen down usme se fir ek fir pura ke ek ek and that was infested with chambal dacoits also nirbhay singh gujjar kar ke ek bahut bada dacoit tha unse milke hum logo ne kiya hai lekin pichle 7 saalon mein wo kaun ka spirit mein hua lekin pichle 7 saalon mein ek mandir tak 
तैयार नहीं हुआ फिर वन डे आई रिसीव ए फोन कॉल फ्रॉम बैंगलोर एंड दैट वाज फ्रॉम माय ग्रेट लेडी मैडम इज ए ग्रेट ऑथर मैडम इज ए ग्रेट बिजनेस वुमेन मैडम इज ए ग्रेट फिलैंथ्रोपिस्ट आल्सो दैट वाज फ्रॉम सुधा नारायण मूर्ति जी तो उन्होंने कहा मोहम्मद आई वुड लाइक टू सी अलोंग विद यू द बटेश्वर टेंपल तो हम लोग गए वहां पूरा दिखाया मैडम हैज कंट्रीब्यूटेड फॉर फॉर क्रोर्स ऑफ रुपीस आल्सो फॉर द रेस्ट ऑफ द टेंपल लेकिन सात पैसा देने के बाद भी सात महीने तक कोई काम नहीं हुआ देन वी हैव टू मेक कंप्लेंट्स अगेन अगेन एंड अगेन फिर अभी काम शुरू कर दिया है दैट इज द प्रॉब्लम यू नो समबडी इज गिविंग मनी एंड यू आर नॉट यूटिलाइजिंग इट तो देने के रास्ता यही है कि जो ना आई मीन ग्रेट कंपनीज कैन कम दे वुड बी गेटिंग दिस वन आल्सो टैक्स बेनिफिट्स आल्सो दे कैन कम they can participate but it takes a lot of time in the in the government projects jab hum log the when i was there i mean mai itna time nahi mil sakta tak sari cheeze bahut aaram se clear karte the much uh, depends upon the officers also but now the system of the government has also become very stringent unnecessarily stringent because of which things are not taking place unse kahe to koi sunta hi nahi There is one uh, last question from uh, okay my okay friend from Andhra Pradesh by name Ashwath Kama. Uh, his question is: uh, It is the private players who contribute much in biblical archaeology to be able to participate in as a private player in Indian archaeology. How we can get in? What kind of infrastructure do we need? Uh-huh. कैसे कैसे मैं आई कुड गेट द क्वेश्चन सर द क्वेश्चन पोजड बाय अश्वथामा इज दिस लाइक इन बिब्लिकल बिब्लिकल आर्कियोलॉजी इन बिब्लिकल एक्सप्लोरेशन इट्स नॉट द गवर्नमेंट दैट इज फंडिंग बट मेनी प्राइवेट प्लेयर्स आर फंडिंग द एक्सकवेशन एक्टिविटीज सो व्हेन दैट कैन दैट हैपन इन इंडियन आर्कियोलॉजी आल्सो इफ इट कैन हैपन हाउ प्राइवेट पीपल प्राइवेट सिटीजंस कैन कंट्रीब्यूट फॉर आर्कियोलॉजिकल explorations that's it sir kuchamena it they, now there is a government has got a national cultural fund is there it is known as nc of national cultural fund so if you have any set of this thing that i would like that this site should be excavated by archaeological survey of india and you can ask what is the cost of it and you can deposit that amount and they would take the take up the archaeological excavation work so that system is there and if you want to conserve any monument that also you can do it so infosys has come that way but the again the problem is you know it is taking a lot of time so who would wait for all these things i have to move uh, this one fast which is not happening in the government in the ministry of culture and sir the last request from mayan is so acha uh, are there any uh, i mean yeah, are there any in, uh, insights that you would like to give for the youngsters who are uh, willing to uh, pursue archaeology uh, both as a passion as well as a career uh, what are the insights couple of insights that you can provide i would say that uh, they should come to archaeology not for a job if it is for a job they have got many avenues now they have got it is there they have got management is there they have got uh, this one uh, as physician they can serve so don't do archaeology for your own for as uh, for a job but if you have the passion if you want to serve if you want to uh, not lead a very cozy life because you know while doing the excavation you like to live in tents and that too sometimes in a remote part of india in various parts क्योंकि जब मैं इनसे बात बटेश्वर में काम करता था तो हम लोग जो ना ये ये वही उसी तरीके के जगह पे जाके रहते थे और उसी तरीके से तंबू में आपको रहना पड़ेगा या कभी कभी नक्सल से आपको डील करना पड़ेगा वाइल आई वॉज वर्किंग इन सामलोर दैट इज जगदलपुर में छत्तीसगढ़ में तो दे वु किडनेप यू फिर उनसे आपको बात करना पड़ेगा इट इज एन एडवेंचरस जॉब आपको कभी कभी वो भी करना पड़ेगा लेकिन बैंगलोर वगैरह में तो खैर तो यू आर इन ए बेटर पोजिशन अदरवाइज यू नो डोंट कम अनलेस यू हैव अ पैशन फॉर द सब्जेक्ट अगर पैशन है 
you can have your own salary without doing without doing work for even a single day to main wahi kehta hu sir aapko kaam karne ki zarurat nahi hoga kyunki ye aapka jo jo hobby hai to hobby ke liye aapko paisa mil raha hai but not a very remunerative job also unless sometimes you know like plays a very important part to kabhi kabhi aap upar pahunch jate otherwise you know it's not a very cosy job but a uh, one which can be recommended for you. yeah there there's a lot more questions i believe but uh, i think uh, in the interest of time we'll have to have a hard stop here um thanks a lot uh, dr mohammed uh, this is a scintillating talk um and i think this will ignite uh, a lot of interest in archaeology and also give them some guidance for those who want to contribute to uh, our culture and heritage and, and archaeology in general in many ways um, so Uh, i i hope you will also grace us one more time uh, sometime later at your convenience so with that uh, sir thanks a lot thank you thank you for uh, joining us today welcome sir welcome welcome thank you so much for giving a very patient hearing thank you it's a delight sir it's a delight it's a privilege thanks a lot thanks everyone for joining thank you thank you Uh, I, I we sincerely thank all the participants for their patience and uh, participation. Thank you. We will end the session now. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much.